Hey guys, welcome to November's Ask Zine Q&A. As you might have read in my community posts, I am switching a new format this month. I'm going from live streams to now doing a recorded version, which is kind of a shame because Ask Zine live stream was kind of catchy, but it's okay. I'm just going to have to come up with a new name. For those of you who are tuning into this series for this first time, welcome. This is a forum where you can ask me all things San Francisco and a little bit about myself. Sometimes I just get those zingers in the comments that it's really difficult to answer in like 500 characters or less. So this is a way that I can kind of reach out and answer your questions in a little bit more depth. So if you are planning a trip to the Bay Area or somewhat newly arrived, leave me a comment when I put out my post for submissions for the next video. And I and my great group of San Francisco friends will try to answer you as best as we can. Okay, our first question this month comes from Carmen Chen. Carmen, thank you so much for being such a longtime viewer. And Carmen asked me, what are my fave places to grab a snack? Well, Carmen, if I'm by myself, I like to go to Joe and the Juice, which is a chain that has locations all over the Bay Area. Since I can't consume caffeine, I like the option of having a fresh pressed juice place. And uh, of course, you know, if you drink caffeine, they do also offer coffees and teas. They have some great menu items too. And I always go for the avocado sandwich, which is made on this Scandinavian crisp bread. So yummy. And mostly it's just a really chill environment. They've got these comfy armchairs so that I can hang for a while and a lot of tables uh, if I ever bring my editing workstation with me. Plus it's never packed, so I kind of like having most of the cafe to myself. My go-to place for meeting friends is The Grove, which has several locations throughout San Francisco. And it's kind of like this coffee house meets fast casual restaurant. They have really long opening hours, lots of seating, and you can get snacks as well as meals there. The food is pretty decent, although the one downside is it's always crowded, so it's not a great place to go if you want a little bit of peace and quiet. And I really like the atmosphere of Bee Patisserie in Lower Pack Heights. First, they have this infinite amount of pastries that you could choose from, plus lots of drinks. Second, they have a lot of seating and you can choose from indoor and outdoor. It's definitely lively and bustling, but you don't feel rushed. Okay, our second question comes from Mindy Muir. Thanks for writing in, Mindy. She asks, what are some nightlife options in San Francisco? Even though I don't cover nightlife extensively, there are a lot of options. SF definitely has a club scene, even though it's not as hip and happening as in other cosmopolitan cities. Uh, Longtime staples would include DNA Lounge, and some of the more recent favorites are Monroe in North Beach, which is a little bit more upscale. Most San Franciscans prefer to go to bars, and I've made a couple of videos on the best bars around here, which I'll include in a playlist up here if you want to check that out. And they range anywhere from dive to upscale to kind of clubby with uh, DJ or live music, and uh, even the kitschy. A few of my personal favorites include Elixir and the Mission, which is a homey dive bar, but it's got such professional bartending and the guys are super nice. And I also like Top of the Mark for something a little bit more sit down and upscale with a great view. And you should definitely go on the weekends when they've got a piano player there, worth the cover all the way. Pig and Idol is this tiki bar in the financial district, which is over the top, and you should definitely check out Bourbon and Branch, which is a mysterious speakeasy. That's all I'll say. If you like to drink with a purpose, many of the museums offer an adult night where you can browse their exhibits after dark with a full open bar and hors d'oeuvres. Some of the ones that offer it are the Exploratorium, the Asian Art Museum, the Legion of Honor, de Young, Cal Academy of Sciences, SF MoMA, the Jewish Contemporary Museum, and a whole bunch of other smaller ones. Oh right, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. I'll provide a full list down in the description box below. Other fun, non-conventional nighttime activities include adult bowling and putt-putt golfing. There's Lucky Strike Bowling, which is in South Beach near Oracle Park Baseball Stadium. Mission Bowling Club in the Mission, and Presidio Bowl in the Presidio. For putt-putt, try Urban Putt in the Mission or subpar miniature golf in Fisherman's Wharf, which has this super fun glow-in-the-dark miniature golfing on Fridays and Saturday nights. And of course, all the shows. For discount tickets, try going to ticksbayarea.org. 
The next question comes from Kristen O'Neill, a recent but frequent viewer. Thanks so much, Kristen, for supporting the channel. And she asks, not sure if you're a big oyster fan or not, but your vid on clam chowder brought us a Hog Island Oyster Company in the Ferry Building and got us into their fresh and amazing oysters. So maybe some more oyster tips if you have any in the city. I still need to take a trip to Tamales Bay. Kristen, yes, I am a huge oyster fan. I actually didn't get into them until well after college. It started out with sushi. You can kind of say that raw fish was my gateway drug. My tips for finding oysters around the city. First, it's really important to have super fresh ones. It makes a huge difference in terms of the texture and the taste. But the problem is the fresher they are, the more expensive they are. So what you gotta do is to track down all of those happy hour oyster places where they sell oysters for a buck. Some of my favorites are Bar Agricole in Soma from five to six daily except Sundays. Bar Crudo in Nopa from 5 to 6.30, except Mondays, and theirs cost a buck fifty each. And finally, Woodhouse Fish Company in Fillmore and DeBose, and they have Dollar Oyster Tuesdays. Which leads me, Kristen, to your second question. What are the best crab cakes in the Bay? Well, while you're there at Woodhouse Fish Company, chowing down on oysters, you can also get an order of their crab cakes, too. It comes topped with a delicious creamy chipotle sauce but my one complaint is the size. They're kind of more like appetizers. Home Plate in the Marina makes a delicious crab cake benedicts for weekend brunch. You get a giant crab cake for a pretty decent price. It kind of gets mixed reviews on Yelp, so I think you'll just have to go there and see for yourself. Okay, Mindy Muir asks, yellow go-kart rentals, worth it? Mindy, yes, worth it to do once with a discount coupon, and there are plenty out there to clip. They're super fun easy to drive, and frankly, everybody stares at you with envy as you drive by. There's also onboard navigation with a lot of great facts about San Francisco, so who knows? You may learn something that you never knew before. The one company that rents it is called Go Car San Francisco, and their hourly rate is somewhere around $60 an hour, although there are plenty of 20% off coupons that you can find at various discount websites. Go for an hour or two, that's really all you need. Uh, just keep in mind that they do take a $500 deposit when you rent it, and they will require you to have collision insurance. Alfredo Rivera, who is planning a trip out soon, asks, the Marriott near Fisherman's Wharf almost always has good prices. What's the catch? Where do you recommend staying at near the wharf or North Beach? So, hmm, Alfredo, I would say that the rates at the Marriott, like most hotels in San Francisco, bounce around depending on the season. During the off season, which is right now, November through February, they are at their lowest rates and they're generally around 175 to 200 bucks. On the weekends, it's even cheaper because during the weekday, they're counting in more expensive business travelers. During the rest of the year or peak season, the rates will rise to between 270 to 330 dollars a night. And because this is one of Marriott's mid-level properties, the pricing is actually in line with how they tier their hotels. From what I can see, it's got good amenities and is pretty nice. The location's also great. It's close enough to all of the tourist attractions, but set far back enough from the main drag that you don't get all the tourist traffic and noise. North Beach is kind of difficult to find hotels. I would recommend scoping out an Airbnb. And if you don't mind staying in a hostel, the Green Tortoise Hostel is awesome. So we have another traveler, Allison S., who asked me, traveling with kids to San Francisco over Thanksgiving week. We're staying in the financial district. Any budget eats? My kids eat everything, not picky. Thanks for the question, Allison. Actually, I'm due to make a traveling San Francisco with kids video, so look for that sometime soon. First, check out my video here on best fast casual restaurants in San Francisco. Outside of that list around your area, also look for The Bird, which is very, very popular among locals. They only make chicken sandwiches, and the chicken pieces are huge. Aside from the frying, it's generally pretty healthy and they use free range birds. Sandwiches are also quite reasonable and will run you about eight bucks a pop. One of my personal favorites is Onigiri, which has locations all throughout the Bay Area and a store very close to you in Embarcadero Center. They make Japanese onigiri, which are the equivalent of sandwiches. 
It's essentially a rice ball that has a protein or vegetable on the inside and then wrapped around the outside with a piece of nori or seaweed so that you can hold and eat it. Again, really high quality ingredients. The rice is partially milled, so it's somewhat brown and that helps it to retain its nutrients. Otherwise, white rice is pretty nutrient poor and they're pretty inexpensive. They run about three to five dollars per onigiri and if you want to round out the meal, you can actually get a bento. Finally, you are likely to wander over to the Ferry Building, which has some phenomenal food options. My favorite budget meal is an empanada or a hand pie at El Porteño. I love the fillings. You've got your pick of savory or sweet, and they kind of tend towards Mediterranean in flavor. Each empanada runs somewhere between six to eight dollars, depending on the filling, and they are quite hearty. A good pointer for doing the ferry building on a budget, most retailers are happy to dole out free samples. So it's a great way to sample all those artisanal products without a gross outlay of cash. Whew, these are good questions. All right, Molly asked me, I will be going to SF next weekend and my question is, what is the best way of transportation and in what order should I visit to save money if my visiting points are Washington Square Park, North Beach, Ferry Building, Pier 39, Fisherman's Wharf, Chinatown, the Palace of Fine Arts, Baker's Beach, and the Golden Gate Bridge. Molly, the best way to do it is by public transportation and you should try to group your attractions together so that you can cut down on the transit time in between. And in fact, some of these are right next to each other so you can make it into one long walking tour. Itinerary number one, start at the ferry building and try to time it for the farmer's market, which are generally on Saturdays and Thursdays and one more day, which I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But once you're done, either walk or take a bus over to Chinatown, which is about two neighborhoods over and stop there for lunch and late afternoon. Try to walk Chinatown from south to north so that you end up at the border of North Beach and explore this really cute and authentic Italian neighborhood. Check out Washington Square, have dinner there, and stay late for drinks at a bar or espresso at a cafe and watch the nightlife go by. Itinerary number two, start out in Fisherman's Wharf, which includes Pier 39 and Girardelli Square. I'd recommend that you rent a bike. There are all day bike rental outfits in Fisherman's Wharf, or you can opt to do the hourly rate with uh, something like a Ford bike. Then bike westward towards the Marina District. If you're gonna forego the bike, you can also get there by catching a bus or calling an Uber. Marina has a lot of great sights to see, including Chrissy Beach, which also has a good view of Golden Gate Bridge, the Palace of Fine Arts, and then if you go further west, the Presidio. And from here, you can walk over to the visitor center of the Golden Gate Bridge. Itinerary number three, start your day with breakfast in either the Inner Sunset or Richmond districts. What's good to get here? Asian cuisine. Then head on over to Golden Gate Park and view the uh, East Park attractions like Japanese Tea Garden, Botanical Garden, Conservatory of Flower, the De Young Museum, and Cal Academy of Science. If you're there on a weekend, you can catch the park shuttle, but it's definitely still walkable to get to the western side of Golden Gate Park, where you'll pass the bison paddocks, the Dutch windmills, and end up on Ocean Beach. From there, you're going to walk north on the boardwalk lining Ocean Beach, and you're gonna stop briefly at Camera Obscura at the Cliff House to check that out, and then eventually make your way to Land's End. There's a really great, very, very easy one and a half mile hiking trail that takes you all the way into the Sea Cliff neighborhood. And from there, you're gonna walk over to Baker Beach. And if you time it just right, you're gonna make it there at the sunset. Okay, last question is from Larry Martinez. Hi Zine, my question to you and your fellow friends regards the LGBTQIA community in San Francisco. With all the development and gentrification in the city, is the queer community still thriving? Is there still diversity in the Castro? Would love your thoughts and observations on these issues. Phew, that's a complicated one to try to unpack in a few minutes, but we're gonna try. So in my view, gentrification has more to do with economics and the influx of wealthy tech workers, mostly millennials, who are moving into the city and pushing out middle to lower income residents. So in the sense of there being a diminished LGBTQIA plus community, I would say no, because in fact, there is quite a large 
open queer population that works in tech. And you could see it thriving day to day on the streets in the city. However, my friends in that community actually had a pretty insightful observation, which I would never have keyed in on, which is that even though the general population is not diminishing, uh, it actually is becoming more homogenized in terms of ethnicity and economics. The new residents are wealthier and Caucasian. So here's what my friends had to say, and I'm just gonna read it to you here. Regarding Castro, the Bay Area reporter, a respected LGBT news source for decades, reported that some people aren't well represented. Gay African American activist Sean Haynes noted that transgender people, women, and bisexual want more inclusion in the neighborhood. He said, we have seen too much displacement, gentrification, and the loss of access to resources and community activities have been profound. My friends also add, in general of the city, the bars serve a predominantly cisgendered white gay male clientele for entertainment that's usually centered around a drag show. To be honest, not sure where trans, lesbian, or ethnically diverse people go to find community these days, other than to clubs with specific theme nights. However, many new establishments have opened recently, from the first gay sports bar called High Tops a few years ago to a new retro video game bar called Detour that opened this year. Hopefully that covered everything you ask. I know that just scratched the surface because this is such a huge topic. That was a lot of questions. But thanks guys for sending those in. I'm gonna start taking questions for December's Q&A. So if you wanna leave your question down in the comments below, and that video will likely be published right before Christmas. Happy exploring, and for those of you in North America, have a great Thanksgiving. I'll see you in December. Peace. If that information was valuable to you, please help me make it available to more people. Subscribe by hitting that red subscribe button down below or like the video by hitting the thumbs up icon. Thanks so much.